Greetings. Hey, thanks for joining me here on the Business of Agriculture. It's me, your host, Damian Mason. Got an excellent show for you today because we're talking about a topic that is very hot and frankly, very concerning to all of us in agriculture that every one of our consumers probably needs to understand but does not. In fact, this is, I always say some of my episodes, you really need to share out with the non-ag friend in your life. Please, please, take this episode and share it with the non-agricultural consumer friend that you have so they'll understand the dire straits that we are in because we're going to talk today about the coronavirus impact on the meat supply, specifically how we are closing down uh, facilities, plant, meat packing plants. I've got Rob Brenneman with me. He is the founder of uh, Brenneman Pork, an Iowa pork company, huge pork uh, deliverer to the market. And we're going to be talking about what this means to you in agriculture, what it means to our consumers. Before we get into that, I want to thank our sponsor. The Business of Agriculture is brought to you by Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit is a Fargo-based software solutions company, but it doesn't matter where they are. They work with clients in 20, let me see here, 600 customers in 26 states and four provinces. Nick Horeb set out to, to create a better solution for agricultural enterprises to manage their money, their marketing, and everything that happens in within their enterprise more profitably. You can check them out at harvestprofit.com. All right, Rob Brenneman, Brenneman Pork, Iowa. Great guy. If you've not heard about Rob Brenneman, read my book, Do Business Better. I actually profile him because he's got such a great story. Uh, you know, bootstraps uh, and then some. Uh, went broke in the 80s like a lot of agricultural enterprises did and came back and here he is. He employs 275 people either contractually or as W-2 employees. He sells about 25,000 hogs, fattened hogs, to the marketplace every week. And we are absolutely experiencing a bottleneck. He's going to tell us all about it. Mr. Brenneman, welcome to the Business of Agriculture. Great to be here, Damien. All right. Well, you and I had a call setting this up, and you gave me some numbers. I just said, okay, there's an operation that normally you sell 25,000 hogs to the market yeah. and you are now sitting on hogs. You told me something that was really troubling just yesterday. We're recording this, dear listener, on April 21st, by the way. So on April 20th, with the plant closures going on, we slaughtered 330,000 hogs on April 20th. And you're saying, okay, well, well is that a good or is that bad? Well, well a little more they, than that, Damien, when the number came out this morning, about 370. Okay, so, so we better did, day yesterday than we thought it was. Okay, with the plant closures going on, yesterday we, we slaughtered 370,000 hogs. Yes. But what's a normal daily harvest? Normal daily harvest this time of year with what we've had should be around 460, 70, with the total capacity probably be at 500 if they wanted, if they could be and they needed to be. So, you know, so we're 100 and we're 100,000 short yesterday of what we needed to, to... Well, on a percentage basis, make it simple for the average American consumer. If we slaughter 100,000 less hogs per day, that's roughly 25%. 25%. So yeah. that means 25% less ham and pork chops and, and every other meat product at the grocery store. Not tomorrow, but eventually, right? Yes, and you can see some of that reflection on what the pork belly and the cutout has done in the last, last week less product that goes to the retailer, the more demand there is for that. And so the carcass price has come back up to where it actually should even be higher, but it's, it's, it's reacted because of the lack of product going to the retailer. Yeah, so here's the thing, just so that people, let's start at the beginning. We just told you why you should be concerned. If there's 25% less pork going through the processing plant, eventually there's 25% less meat at the grocery store right? Yes. Okay. Let's start at the beginning for folks that don't fully understand how uh, production agriculture works. You have all these employees and you have all these hogs and let's just go ahead and go square one. Tell me how this works. You got a sow, which is an adult female. You got a boar or uh, that provides the semen. You make little piglets. This is why people don't understand. This isn't something that can be turned on in a snap. Tell us about how this works. So we've got a process and, and, and um, everybody, you know, compares this to factory farming. Well, we can't shut this off and it's production agriculture. So when we start, you know, we have a gilt or a sow that's been weaned or bred, whichever, or ready to be bred. So from the day she is inseminated, it's 115 days until she goes to market, or, or pharaohs. 
And so after she furrows, the pigs are on the side 21 days. Hang on, for, hang on. For, for a person that's not been around hog operation, farrow means birthing the pigs. Birthing. Yeah, birthing the pigs, yep. Yeah. And so, you know, so we have people dedicated to that. And so we've spent an entire, I mean, we've spent a year getting an animal ready to start as a gilt, which is the first litter female. And so you've got 35% of them, you've spent an entire year every day getting ready for that first insemination to have their first babies, which is the better animal that you have because she's genetically improved. So from that day, you inseminate them with the best semen you can, do the best job you can, and you carry ahead 115 days then she has her baby pigs, which is called farrowing. When she farrows, then we proceed to, you know, get every pig full of colostrum. We call it warm, dry, and full of milk. And, and so the, they get immunity sooner because the colostrum for the mama passes immunity. So it passes on to the baby pig and then they stay healthy. And that baby pig is on that mama for roughly 21 days. And then when that baby pig is, is weaned, taken away from the mama, then it goes into a nursery. So, so the thing when you think about, we've got 20, 25,000 pigs a week that go to market. We also have 25,000 pigs a week that have to move from a nursery to a finisher, which is where the pigs are fattened. And we also have 25,000 pigs a week that have to be moved from the mama to the nursery. So it's a system that just keeps moving. And when the end of that system gets clogged up, it has the potential to affect the entire system down the road because <clears throat> once an animal is bred to have babies, you can't stop it. Yeah, so that's the issue is that we've already got this sow uh, that's got the, the piglets uh, nursing and then they get off of her and you wean them and they go to the nursery. And then at nursery, those piglets have to go to the next place and be is their wieners, as we call them, right? Yep. And those, those wieners got to go somewhere. And then they go to what you call finishing barns. So yep. tell everybody, just so that everybody understands about that, you take those piglets that are now weaned and they're maybe 15 to 20 pounds. Take me from there. Yep, yep. so you're roughly... 14 to 15 pounds when they're weaned. They go into a nursery. It's, you know, it's like a mini daycare. They get more attention. And so they're on a plastic flooring and they, you know, the temperature is warmer and the air quality is good. And then, so they get hand fed and gruel fed for the first couple of days because they just came off of a secure food supply from mama. And now they gotta, so you gotta kind of tend to them and you got extra caregivers in there to take care of those babies to keep them weaned and get them started. So then they're in there for roughly 40 days or so. And then they've done well and, you know, there's, there's the, a high, high, high percentage of them come out and go on the other side of that and go into a finisher. And then, and then when they go to a finisher, because this is the other thing that folks would understand, because I had someone say, well, if they can't take these hogs to be slaughtered, why don't they just keep them? Why don't we, Rob? Because there's, it's a system. And so the pigs come out of the nursery they go to the finisher and the finisher needs to be empty and we wash and disinfect it every time we empty it. So then the pigs go into that building. It's called all in and all out. And so we do all in and all out in all of those buildings so that we maintain the health of the animal. So there's really hardly any antibiotics used in our system and a lot of systems today because of all in and all out. And so all in and all out to the person that's still trying to understand the meat system, you've got this barn that yep. he contracts, maybe Rob and, and Brenneman Pork contracts with a farmer that maybe lives down the road from, you know, yep. me in Indiana. And, and the majority of those are young guys with families. In so a young, a young farmer wants to make extra money. So yep. they build a barn and to say, we're going to finish pigs. We're going to take 15 pounders off of Brenneman Pork and we're going to put them in this barn and we're going to feed them until they're 275 pounds roughly. Yep. Well, you got the seg of the nursery in between. Okay. So, go, so you have a guy that does nursery contracting and goes to 40 to 45 pounds. That's a family that takes care of those. And then you move it on to the next family that takes care of the finishing barn that holds that amount of pigs. And we all take all the pigs out of the nursery and put them into a finisher that all the pigs are emptied out of. And they have, it's power washed and disinfected and dried. And now you've got a healthy environment. So those 45 pounders were supposed to go to this barn and this yep. barn now couldn't send theirs to slaughter because 
the the processing plant is closed and so they're sitting on them and they're saying okay okay and now that we just have the backup so you know folks understand that this this system works because every day there's stuff in the pipeline and you can't shut it off because we're taking that 45 pound pig before it goes to slaughter up to about roughly 275 pounds right yeah 270 80 pounds yeah okay 278 pounds and it took from the time it came out of the mama sow until it goes to that processing plant is roughly nine and a half months six months from the time it came oh, out i'm sorry i'm sorry six six yep. six months six yep. months six yep. months yes yes i'm talking about then the gestation but part. all of the way back yes yep. all the way on. back from the time when we first when we first bred the sow it's nine and a half nine months. months yep 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 you so, got it. So now everybody understands the system and now let's talk about what it means to us because now I think we're explaining that you can't just shut it off because those pigs need somewhere to go. And then the processing plants are shutting down. And we just talked about 25% deduction. You had a conversation because all of your hogs go through Tyson. Tell me about the conversation you learned about with Tyson last night. So we had a conversation last night with our, our head buyer at Tyson in Columbus Junction. Columbus Junction is, is starting to slaughter some pigs here this morning because they've been down for um, a little over two weeks because they had some cases. And so they, they, had, they went down to clean up and, and be ready for you know, whatever they need to do. And so they started in last night. In the meantime, they, they had us taking pigs to other Tyson plants. We also do have three loads a day that go to JBS and Ottumwa and they, they've stayed consistent. There hasn't been any issues there, but the rest of them all go to Tyson. And so we've been, we have taken pigs to um, Logansport, Indiana, to Tyson plant. We have taken pigs to Perry, Iowa, to Tyson plant, and Waterloo, Iowa, to Tyson plant. And, and every one of those plants today, other than Columbus Junction, I'm, Perry might be going, but yesterday they were all shut down. Logansport, Columbus Junction, Waterloo and Perry were all shut down for the first time, as long as I can remember, we did not sell pigs yesterday. All right, so now we have explained how the whole thing works. And that's why we wanted to go from that beginning. So what the problem is, is that you didn't sell pigs and you've got space, you're doing everything because you're a good hog company, you're a good hog producer, you're finding places to hold them up for a while. How long can you do that? If, if we start back, and right now we're basically one week behind on the amount of pigs that we needed to have slaughtered, okay? So we've got them all backed up in the system. And of course we had to throw a different type of feed so they wouldn't get too big. And so we've slowed them way down. And so we have doubled up some pigs as wean pigs in the finishers behind that. So you can put twice as many wean pigs in a finisher as you can. So we have pigs in a finisher and a nursery. So we could probably, if, if we could pick up and get back to at least 60 to 70% normal this week, we could probably go three weeks at this pace. And, and then we're gonna start running out of where we can't stack, we cannot stack pigs anymore. So there will be, and I think a lot of people in the industry are, are like that. Um, but we've been probably hit a little harder because our plant in Columbus Junction was one of them that was affected because it shut down. Well, as we're recording this, uh, like I said, here we are on April 21st doing our recording. Uh, the Tyson plant in Logansport, Indiana, it's about 45 miles from my home farm. Uh, they closed. And then a JBS facility that slaughters 20,000 hogs per day in Worthington, Minnesota, they closed. And then we knew about the, uh, the big Smithfield in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. They are already closed. So we continue to close these plants because employees uh, either are getting tested and have COVID-19 and then there's the other issue of sometimes they're not showing up. We'll get to that in a minute. But the part about the capacity, what you just heard Mr. Brenneman say of Brenneman Pork is that they might be able to have, you can probably stack things, hold things up, cut hogs back a little bit uh, on feeding three weeks at most. And if our plants are closed beyond that, this is what a lot of consumers don't understand. What are we left with? We start aborting pigs, start, to, what, what's your plan? So if, if God forbid it were to do that, we would have to start aborting pigs 
and and be we we would not we would not in any way want to have to euthanize market ready pigs. That would just that is not in my blood. I I, I couldn't do it, and I hope and pray we never have to. Um, these are perfectly healthy pigs. We'll be able to stall them long enough with the feed we've got, and we would have to abort some sows. We would literally have to abort sows. Yeah, so you abort sows, which again, dear listeners, the bomb sow, and then we're also going to have to be aborting newborn piglets because, yeah. as Rob said, we we can't take something that's taken five and a half months to get it from newborn to ready to be made into pork chops and that the the waste. But do you see that happening? Because I'm afraid I'm afraid that that will happen. I think there's been some of the aborting sows already, um, and there has been some some I- liquidation of some sows today, but that doesn't take our pigs away from growing. There is some, and aborting sows will happen before we euthanize market-ready pigs. Right. That would be a desperation move. Okay, so you think we've got two to three weeks yep. before we need to do that? Yes. Okay, then we're going to talk about shortages, and then we're going to talk about the other thing. So I go to the grocery store, and I tell everybody, man, realize it's the processing. There's everything here. And they're like, and, and the consumer screams bloody murder. Well, I heard they're killing pigs and just throwing them in a pit in Iowa, but there's now a shortage of meat. Now we've explained why that happens. You want to extrapolate on any of that? That has up today... I have heard of nothing that's ready for market being euthanized and thrown in a pit. I have heard of a few pigs that they couldn't get sold as wean pigs that probably got euthanized and they would have went into compost or rendering. I've heard of some sows being aborted and they weaned the pigs and left them in the crates so they wouldn't have to euthanize the wean pigs. The percentage of sows being aborted the number doesn't sound real high yet, but I can tell you that there's not a, a day that goes by that I don't have five conversations with, with large producers that are at the top of their mind. If we go too long, we're going to have to make a decision, and that will affect the amount of pigs coming to market, you know, six months from now. And... Um, I mean, it, it will. Yeah, it will. And then we're, that's where a lot of folks don't realize we're not talking about a meat shortage next tomorrow necessarily, but right. two weeks, one month, two to six months from now. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we have exports and um, that eat up, you know, 25 to 30 percent of our product today. And you know what happens when this country gets to that point, then your exports, your price of meat will go up high enough that exports will shut off and, or we'll shut them off, one of the two, and take care of our people at home first. Yeah, so we're going to have an issue where we'll go through, we got so much now because it can't get processed, then we've got, we've killed off a bunch of supply, and then we got shortages, and then with that, there'll be, obviously, lower supply increases demand, which increases... Yep. The demand stays the same, supply goes down and increases the price. Yeah. We're going to get to another thought now about the plants. Before we do that, we got to thank our sponsor, which is Harvest Profit. You can check out Harvest Profit at harvestprofit.com. They'll give you a free 14-day trial. Uh, Nick Horb founded this company and said, I want to help farming operations be more profitable. Uh, so how you can implement this software product, you can go through even a test trial run on their website. It's about uh, profit analysis, grain marketing, grain inventory, managing your operations. Operation, looking at your money, check it out. It's harvestprofit.com and tell them Damien sent you. I don't know. They always say that on TV. All right, back to Rob Brenneman here at Brenneman Pork. Uh, these plants, I have said that we need to realize that these workers uh, are as important as healthcare workers and police firemen. They are on the front lines. They're like soldiers. And food security, as you and I both know, because we're ag guys, it's basically a national security issue. If we get to where we are so weakened, we become vulnerable as a nation. The Irans, the Chinas, the, the Russias, they would love to see us get more weakened. So if we don't do something about this, and I say we need to put all kinds of testing and we need to do everything we can to keep the food supply going and we need to incentivize those workers. What do you think? Oh man, we're on the same page. So, um, so like I said, we've had lots of discussions every day 
there's a there's a consulting vet I work with by the name of Dr. Tim Lola, which I'm pretty sure you met. He's from St. Peter, Minnesota. Uh, I'll put a plug in. He's probably the smartest and the best veterinarian I know in the world. Um, that's because he's a good friend. And um, so I, he's been working on that testing thing with, you know, like we're used to that world in the pig business, you know, with PERS and, you know, the PERS virus. And so we do a lot of testing and we do testing and removing and we do, you know, we do the virus thing and try and make the herd negative and keep it negative. So we know in our world, this would be a common day, the coronavirus that, that the humans are going through. And I, I told Doc Tim when he first, when this first started, I said, I think you veterinarians could probably help solve this problem, not to take anything away from the healthcare workers, but it's because it's, it's our world every day. And so when we look at the entire system today, I don't think any of us ever thought it would come down to the fact that the person at the packing plant decided he wasn't, he was scared to go to work and didn't go to work. And in turn, our pigs don't get slaughtered. None of us thought of that when this all started happening because we were an essential business, right? The food supply is an essential business. But if the person is too scared or concerned to go to work, and then we came out with a government program that says, we're going to pay you if you don't go to work. And I kind of, I told my wife in the process, they should have said, you keep going to work and we'll incentivize you to go to work because our food supply is so crucial. And if things that we mentioned earlier, if we have to euthanize pigs of any fashion, or we have to abort pigs of any fashion and other industries in the meat side have to do the same thing, then you're going to create, if you create a food phenomenon, Katie bar the door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we get to where, and this is something we've never seen in this country. When I started hearing about these meat plant closures, it was Easter Sunday. I read an article and I said, Lori, I got to shoot a video. I just, I wouldn't even, I didn't put the Easter ham away. I had my Easter ham and I said, I want you to understand what this means because the average consumer is not that they're bad people. They're just far removed from the world you live in every day. And that I speak to and work with every day. I'm like, you realize what, if we can't get these things processed and harvested, what that means is then we lack supply. And then the farmer reaction is going to be, let's get rid of hogs and let's get rid of sows. And then three months, six months from now, we become a weaker, less fed, uh, protein deficient country. And while you can say, oh, well, the vegetarians, oh, we shouldn't be eating meat anyhow. Well, great. You know what? Uh, soy burgers and beyond meat, those get made in processing plants also. So those workers are facing the same risk. And, yeah. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Very true. Uh, okay. Do you see food shortages, meat shortages? Well, you, you go to the, there was a thing, a gal the other day in Washington, Iowa, went to the, to the um, grocery store and there was basically no meat. This was like a week ago. There was no meat on the shelves. The comment was, and I think you probably saw it, it was there's 30,000 pigs a day slaughtered within 25 miles of this grocery store and there is no meat for sale. That's a problem. So yes, there could be meat shortages. Are we out of product? No, because the pigs are still on the ground, but we can't get it into the right process for the human to consume. And that goes all the way to, we've had people want to buy a couple of pigs. Now, if they can slaughter them themselves and package them, then, then we've done that. But to go to a local butcher shop, they're booked up for like three months. And um, so that isn't the solution. I will tell you what's funny is that you said that because again, you and I both operate in rural America and, and we're around this. And I had somebody on social media tell me that it was just atrocious that the factory farms were doing this to starve America. They should give their pigs to some local butcher. And I said, well, first off, I don't think you can make any money giving pigs away. Secondly, why don't you go and find that local butcher that's ready? The guy that has a facility three miles from my farm, he's a friend of mine. And he yeah. called me up and said, hey, I don't have any butcher dates for your steers until 2021. I said, what? We, we, you, you always keep September and October dates yeah. where he says, I'm sorry. So these places are glutted right now. Yes, they are. That's a fact. Absolute fact. And, um, but, you know, so 
but if they have their own their own stuff at home, they can do it, but not too well, many people can do that. You and I both, we can count on probably both hands the number of people we know that actually know how to take a live pig and turn it into pork chops. Exactly. Okay, exactly. here's the next thing. About the workers, we think that they should be incentivized in testing. Do you think that my idea is going to get any traction? You and I are saying, of all things, okay, put the put that worker, get them tested, uh, you know, give them the equipment, but uh, also give them hazard pay. Federal, if we can pay $600 a week bonus from the federal government to be unemployed and sit at home and watch Wheel of Fortune, by God, we can give you $600 bonus to go in and keep the food supply strong. I agree with that 100%. I believe that we can get them tested because I know that there's people at the D-Lab in, in Ames, Iowa. I'm pretty confident that if you could get the test to them, they could figure out how to run the test. I do believe that's possible. And I do believe if Doc Tim, he's, he's put a solid effort on trying to help make this happen. And there's also another guy, a, a veterinarian in Orange City, Iowa, Dave Baumgars. The two of those are in constant contact, but I don't think they're taken seriously by the people on the other side because it's nothing for the D-Lab to run 10,000 tests a day. And they're putting out 700 test kits to some somebody that or some place that employs 3,000 people. What's that going to do? You need 3,000 test kits, and not only do you need to test them the first day, you probably need to test them once a week, and that would give your workers in the packing plants and even on our facilities the comfort level that they're going to be safe when they go to work, and that's what they want. And the, and the reality is most people that are working in the United States aren't in the more vulnerable populace. You're not talking about 75 to 90 year old people. You're talking about younger men and women. Uh, and many of them, we've already proven they can get this virus and be asymptomatic and still go about their business. There's no risk to the food. There's The coronavirus is not transmitted by food. It's not a foodborne transmitted disease. It's not like E. Cola, uh, e. coli or salmonella. So that would be fine. All right, so here's the next thing. You told me that Tyson is doing everything they can that at the facility where your hogs go, they put in barricades and barriers and plastic things and all this, but there's a cost we slowed down the ability to process. So imagine, dear listener, you go to a General Motors facility where they make pickup trucks, like the one by my farm, and you say, oh, you can't walk over there with those parts now. You've got to do this, this, and this, and there's these barricades. You know, we're just, oh, well, we're only going to build like half as many trucks because we just slowed down the process. That's what's happening, right? That's what's happening, and um, we have slowed the process down, and and it's in, you know, the workers want to be comfortable to come to work and that's what it's gonna take. And, and I commend Tyson for, for seeing that. And I can tell you Tyson, every day we're on the phone at least 10 times and I know they're doing everything in their power to, to get our pigs slaughtered. And I know they are everybody's pigs. And I think they're in a catch 22 and I, um, there's, nothing there, I do, there's nothing they're doing wrong today, but we're all learning from this. And I think that um, everybody will be better because of it. But we're kind of in a pickle right now. Okay, so here's the thing, Mr. Brenneman. Uh, the average person that's a, a, a consumer than in suburbia of America says, all right, so there's less pork. I'll just go ahead and eat chicken. Uh, I'll just, I guess I'll just have some more burger. Answer that. Well, everybody knows that best, the best meat out there is pork. And... <laughs> They could eat chicken, but the same thing's going to happen there, um, and everything's going to be equal. Everybody's going to be equal. I knew that you. I knew that you were going to give a plug to pork because you're you're uh, you're a pork guy. But I was going to make sure that I pointed out that this is happening with poultry. This is happening with beef. This is happening with everything that has to. And it, frankly, it is happening with plant-based stuff also. Because believe it or not, dear listener, those those uh, uh, protein sources like lentils and peas and soybean product they go to a processing facility that's a food processing facility to get made into those squished uh, formulated uh, bean patties also uh, so it's going to happen across the board do, what's your outlook what do you see happening I, I i believe that it will change the industry all the way around i i think that what we see today is maybe our industry is uh has is through efficiencies and production has maybe gotten 
a little bit bigger than it should because we get into a two day bind and we're behind. And so I, I, the industry is probably gonna have to get right sized. And there's the solder plants, if they're gonna implement those type of things to make the worker feel comfortable, I guess my question is, is how do you ever take them away in the future? How do you take something away that made somebody feel good today? And when you take it away in six months, are they still gonna be feeling good? Because the worker is the most important thing we have. Our employees are the most important thing we have because once Char and I got past the point of where we could do it ourselves, which she wanted it to be sooner than I did because I liked working with her, but maybe she didn't like it as much with me. But once it got beyond that, your, your type of thinking had to change that now it's not about, it's not about Char and I, it's not about Brendan Pork. It's about the people that work for us. And that's the same way it is at Tyson or the local grocery store. So when you put in these things to say, okay, we're gonna make sure it's secure and comfortable that you come to work and you enjoy coming to work and you feel safe, you're not gonna take those away, I don't think. In Which means we just slowed down chain speed, uh, as it says in the, in the meat plants, but uh, we're processing less. So we need more plants. And now yeah. here's the next thing for those that always wonder, is it because we've got such a big farm, big ag system? Okay, would a bunch of smaller plants be better? I don't know, because I saw a small plant that only has like, I don't know, 40 employees has the coronavirus issue there too. There's a plant that kills, that slaughters roughly 600 a day. They close when one employee one employee got tested positive. So imagine that's worse than what we got today if all those were closed. I mean, we wouldn't be in any better shape. And, and the consumer wants a good product, but ultimately the consumer still buys off a price. And when you raise the price on something, the consumer gets nervous. Um, they're, they're gonna buy on price. And you keep raising the price on everything. And if you slow the chains down, and you put more cost into that, and we end up with more cost, somebody's gonna pay more for that product, and it's still gonna be cheap in percentage of what your income is. Yeah, you I think we, we, can, we can stand a 10% increase in food, frankly. Uh, yes. The media will scream bloody murder, but that's actually very, very yes. doable. Okay, yes. uh, his name is Rob Brenneman, and uh, they're at Brenneman Pork. You can look them up online. Uh, like I said, I wrote about them in my book. Speaking of books, if you get bored and you're sitting around being quarantined, order up a copy of Food Fear. It's my book about the business of food and agriculture. It's straight talk. About well, this mine's food. right over here. <laughs> That's right. He's got a copy. Uh, okay, we talked about a lot of stuff. Now let's talk about the money. This is the last thing uh, that I want to cover with our listeners because they see what we threw, we threw $16 billion to farmers and we're throwing nine, uh, $3 billion to food purchases. I shot a video and said $3 billion of food purchases over the next 10 months is a crumb on the smorgasbord. It is, we spend $1.7 trillion on food and beverage in the United States of America every year. $3 billion is less than two tenths of 1%. Putting numbers in perspective is what I do because I'm an ag econ guy, but here's the thing. They're talking about giving you $250,000, not being arrogant, but $250,000 is your operating expense for one day. One day. So $250,000 to Brenneman Pork makes them solvent for one yeah. day. Not even quite, uh, maybe like seven hours. <laughs> a part of one day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's where a lot of folks, they, they see the big numbers and they hear this thing about USDA, it still doesn't fare it out. If they cap Brenneman pork at $250,000, it doesn't even cover one day. And that's the unfortunate reality of this. The best thing we can do for American agriculture is the best that we can do for the American economy. And that is? Yeah, we need to sell pork, process pigs, open the economy back up and let people go to work. I mean, that, that will resolve this problem. That's the answer. His name's Rob Brenneman. Check him out at Brenneman Pork. They're good people. I've been there in Washington, Iowa, and uh, they've been a client of mine, and they, uh, they, they know their business about pork. Uh, by the way, keep eating your pork. Don't panic. We're going to keep you fed, but by golly, be concerned when you hear about, oh, better be safe than sorry. Let's just shut the whole thing down. Folks will starve, and that's, and that's not just tomorrow. It's like we said, look at the supply chain. Yeah, six months from now.
Watch and see what happens. The uh, the business of agriculture is available not just as an audio wherever you get your podcast, be it Stitcher, iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, or you can always find it at DamianMason.com. It's also now a video. That's why you're seeing that lovely, handsome man there, Rob Brenneman, from uh, from his office in Iowa. You're also seeing me. So go on YouTube. It's the Damian Mason channel. It's D Mason Comedy, and uh, subscribe, please. Uh, the playlist is business of agriculture. Uh, this episode was brought to you as many episodes have been now by Harvest Profit. Harvestprofit.com is where you can get your information. It'll help keep your agricultural enterprise more profitable, managing your, it's a, it's a software solution to manage your money, your marketing, everything you do in your ag enterprise. Hey, thanks for being here, Mr. Brennan. Thank you, Damon. Keep up the great work, buddy. All right. Till next time, it's the business of agriculture. Right.